Hi, welcome to Commerce Conversations. I'm Steve Denton, and I'm excited to have Brian Dubb with us today, the CEO of Commerce Hub. You know, when you think about Commerce Conversations, you should probably start with the CEO of the Commerce Hub. So Brian, welcome to Commerce Conversations, or as I like to call them, Conversations. Mm -hmm. um, so we're excited to have you, welcome. Yeah, thanks for having me. This is, this is great, I'm excited. So a lot going on. Right. I mean, uh, first of all, congratulations uh, on the acquisition of, of Channel Advisor. You talk about two market leaders there. So maybe for the folks that that don't know, like, what does it mean for the market leader of you know 3P inventory to make an acquisition like that? What are you excited about, and what does that bring to the industry? Sure. I, I think you know, for starters, Commerce Hub has a has a long history, or 25 years plus of of serving the largest retailers in the space and helping them power all of their unowned inventory and all that 3P inventory and get it to their customers. So they can expand selection, customers are happy, they get the right thing to the doorstep. And Channel Advisor has got a 20 plus year history as well, really focused on helping brands connect to customers across all different channels, whether they're, they're retailers or public marketplaces and doing it in North America, in Europe, in uh, APAC. And so really bringing these two together, we bring this best of breed for retailers and best of breed for, for brands. And I think what we're excited about is not only bringing two market leaders together, but it's the types of things that we can start to light up that only work when you can help this massive network of tens of thousands of companies connect with the largest retail channels anywhere in the world. Yeah, it's exciting. And, and what a great acquisition and great merger of, of, of companies. So for folks in the audience that, you know, 1P inventory, 3P inventory, like maybe to get some jargon out. Like, <laughs> if, what is 3P inventory? Why does it matter and, and, and who does that? Yeah, I, so you know, I think if you if you oversimplify what a retailer is in the business of, there's the items that they that they have laid out their own money for and that they own. Let's just call that one P. It's their owned inventory. They've negotiated with these brands and suppliers to, uh, to to house that, and they take on all the risk. However, then you have this whole other bucket of all of these other manufacturers, all these brands. Sometimes it's the same brand; it's just an extended part of their catalog where the brand wants to hold on to that inventory. Maybe they don't want to commit it to a particular retailer or a particular channel. They want more flexibility. They may want to hold it back to sell directly to the consumer. And, and all of that all sits out in this, in this third party or, or 3P bucket. Hmm. And you know, for the retailers, what they want is they want to be able to offer this infinite aisle, this endless supply for their customers, but they don't, ha they don't want to have to lay out the cash because they don't know exactly what's going to resonate with their customers. Hmm. Same with the owner, the manufacturer of that item, wants to hold on to it because they don't know if that's going to sell better through Amazon or it's going to sell better through eBay or better through Macy's or through Best Buy. And, and they want that flexibility. So we're really in the business of, of connecting all of those manufacturers and brands and sellers who own inventory with the retailers who have the demand and being able to match them up in real time. That's fantastic. So thinking about the audience a little bit, mm -hmm. let's say I'm watching this, this, this commerce conversation and you know, I'm, I'm a manufacturer of I don't know, crushable red hats. Mm -hmm. I just made that up. Yep. <laughs> so I make crushable red hats, pretty awesome. I want to get into this third party. I, I want to get into that marketplace game. Like, how do I do that? Like, do I connect with you and you connect me with these retailers? Do I connect with these retailers directly and then they connect me to you? Like, how does somebody get in that game as, as a manufacturer? Yeah, so as a manufacturer, that, that's where we're here to help because you know, for most of these manufacturers, you're trying to grow, you're trying to get access to more channels, you're trying to scale, and yet you don't have an unlimited budget to invest in technology. You can't, you can't yourself be doing your own wiring into Amazon and then into Target Plus, and then, oh, now you're Red Hats, it's, you're gonna strike a deal at, at Kohl's perhaps, or, mm -hmm. or somewhere else. You, you just can't do the wiring every time. And what, really fo what we focus on for our manufacturers is to give them that one-stop shop. Mm. They wire up with us, whatever system they're using to manage all their inventory, it's one connection, and we will help them expose that inventory to every channel where they want to list it. Now, some of those channels, uh, they just list it straight on. You go onto Amazon, you create your Seller Central account, yeah. and we will manage all of that for you. In fact, for some of our, for uh, actually quite frankly, most of, our, most of our newer customers, we even provide a service where they don't even need their own technology staff. We'll run it for them. Right. And so if they're a manufacturer of the Crushed Red Hat Company, right. uh, we'll help them connect to as many channels as possible we, we want to be in the business of empowering our brands to really, to really grow and serve the world's commerce and do so through relationships. And we can help facilitate those relationships, whether it's to Amazon or, or Target Plus or, or Macy's or Kohl's or, or wherever the case may be. That's awesome. Because I think you know, that ecosystem is not a really well understood ecosystem, right? Um, so moving forward, right? I'm going to advance the, the conversation a little bit. 
So we're filming this about a week after Black Friday, mm -hmm. Cyber Monday. Um, you know, what, what's the story out there maybe that you guys saw? Like I can tell you what we saw here at Where to Go. So at Where to Go for the second straight year, Cyber Monday bigger than Black Friday. Yep. The weekend, Saturday and Sunday, after Black Friday, bigger than Black Friday. Really? And in fact, this past Monday, bigger than Black Friday. So a couple of trends, right? That mm -hmm. one um, that we see, and I'm just curious what you guys see, because you got, you've got a larger footprint. Yeah. But um, consumers are shopping later, right? If you think about last year, the storyline was supply chain issues. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna buy early, because I'm afraid there's not gonna be any large size shirts in blue. Mm -hmm. Right, like when it's time to buy. So yep. people bought early and we saw that last year. This year, everybody knows that there's a lot of inventory out there. People were sitting on a ton. They're expecting a lot of deals, a lot of press around deals and discounts mm -hmm. and, and moving inventory. So, and that with the economic headwinds of inflation, people were waiting and we're seeing that, right? That's why, like I said, last, this past Monday, week after Cyber Monday, it was bigger than Black Friday. And I think we're gonna see a late holiday shopping season all the way up to December 22nd right. versus last year they went, you know, consumers yeah. went early. Yeah, that's, right. that's what I'm seeing. What are you seeing or what's the story, Brian, nobody's talking about that you can just tell me and whoever yeah. else. Just, just, the, just the secret part. Just the other people. Well, so, right. so, so uh, uh, you know, a couple of things I think we saw. One, you know, if we look back over the last month or two, we started to see some of these early signs of maybe a little pullback. Right, and you saw it in some of the some of the public numbers for some of the public companies. We we even start start to see it in early November. The comps were a little challenging, mm -hmm. but like you mentioned, it's also coming off a strong comp where where people were trying to buy earlier and concerned about out of stock and concerned about inventory issues. And so, um, to be honest, we were maybe a little apprehensive heading into that heading into that long holiday weekend because you started to see some comps that were um, that, that were less favorable. Yeah. And then what we saw is even coming into that week of Thanksgiving, and certainly uh, Thanksgiving Day, Black Friday, all the way through Cyber Monday, we just saw this nice ramp up. And really, I think the, the, the strength of consumer demand, uh, you know, we saw it hold back, and, and I think what we saw is maybe similar to what you were seeing, is maybe some, some tendency, yeah. but pushing it later, and then really saw that growth and really saw that spike pull through. Uh, and we saw that across virtually every sector. You know, yeah. I think we're pretty lucky that we have exposure to almost every sector, subsector there is out there in, in, in e-commerce. Yeah. And we saw that pull through really across the board in a real positive way. I mean, I think you guys see what, $50 billion of gross merchandise sales across yeah. 18,000 merchants. Yeah. Did I get those stats you, right? You, uh, good. Yeah. Good stats. So, so yeah, so you see a pretty big, were there any categories, like for us, categories, obviously electronics and home goods. Mm -hmm. Like we've just seen home goods just way up year over year. So, wow, yeah. yeah. I, I, you know, I think I think for us the the places that we see, just because we do we do see every category, uh, we didn't see any any categories. Let's say against season spike. So if you imagine things like like home improvement, mm -hmm. there's not a lot of people in the Western Hemisphere kicking off home improvement projects as we head into winter. Right. right? That's much more of a of a spring and summer seasonal. So we didn't see dramatic corrections or pullback in, or, or pull forward in those spaces. Mm -hmm. But we did see a. Uh, I think when we look on a week-on-week on week basis as well as on an annual comp basis, uh, we genuinely saw strength in almost every single sector. Oh, wow. And then when you start to pick it apart by retailers, some retailers may be a bit more successful with their strategy, with their marketing strategies, some a little less so. But when we when we zoom out because we see everything, uh, it's been uh, it's been healthy all the way across the board. Hmm. That's fantastic. Yeah. So that's a really good recap of how things are looking going into the peak season as as we exit twenty. 22. Um, but you know, Brian, one of the things that a lot of, and you look, you're a global company. So mm -hmm. data, data, like data rules, like different countries, different rules. But, you know, we'll set that aside for a minute because mm -hmm. that could be an entire like, three hour conversation. Talk, yeah. But I'm just curious, like, where are the biggest gaps that you see where either merchants or manufacturers could be leveraging data to drive better commerce experiences or better outcomes? Sure. So, you know, we, we're fortunate that we get to work with so many different customers. We see we see lots and lots of different data flowing through. And then, like you asked about some of those gaps that we see pop up. So there's a couple places where we really try to help our customers get smarter about what they're doing. So even if you think of things like very simple, hey, if I'm selling, a, a, you know, if I'm selling batteries on, uh, on Amazon and on Target and on Walmart, 
Are there things that we can help them do just to drive better pricing or more real-time reactive pricing? Something really simple, but mm. ultimately a data problem. Uh, and so we've been solving those types of problems for years. The things that start to get more interesting is when we start to connect some of the commerce data and the demand data and connect it in with the shipping and the fulfillment data. So for example, we've been, we've been helping customers better anticipate if I, if I order something from a site, when's it going to get to the customer's doorstep? Right. And what we saw is connecting what we know about our brands and manufacturers and their fulfillment times with what the retailer wants to promise. When we can narrow that window and give them more confidence, more accuracy, we saw it was actually increasing the conversion rate on those products. And so when you start increasing the conversion rate, all of a sudden the consumer's happier because they're finding what they're looking for. They're getting an uncertainty. Hey, it's going to be here on Thursday instead of you know, a seven to 12 day range or something like yeah. this. The retailer's happy because they're selling more and the brand's happy because they're, they're growing. And so we've started to really connect our fulfillment data and our, and our shopping data and try to pull those back together. Makes sense. Yeah, predictability, um, transit times, predictable delivery times. Mm -hmm. um, we see a ton of that as well. The other thing, uh, not necessarily on the data side, but optionality, right? Which is, like one of the things we see is uh, green solution, sustainable, right? Yeah. We see we see where 60% of the consumers will say, you might not even be in my consideration set if you don't have a sustainable option. Mm. Like we've all wow. kind of come into this world where everybody thinks it's gotta be one or two days, but you know, more and more optionality around sustainable options. And that just might be a three day ground delivery. And to your point, as long as it is predictable and as long as it's communicated, we see more and more people opting in for that sustainable option. And just optionality becomes pretty critical and data drives that. I, I think so. The thing that, the, the word we use internally and that we see resonating with our customers is, is certainty. Yeah. And so the, the interesting thing that, again, there was that big race to same day or, or, or one day or, or two days. And, and we see one just on the back end of the supply chain problems through 21. And as that's flown, as that's kind of continued to roll through the system in 22, you see more variability in the de in delivery timings. Where we really see that drive up matching consumer demand is when there's certainty. It's not even the absolute number of days, but I if it says I'm going to get it on Thursday, I really get it on Thursday. Yeah. And and we see the the difference in customer satisfaction, customer experience, repeat purchase rates. Uh, there's a, a product we brought to market earlier this year for our retailer side to help them give better visibility and transparency to their end customer. And we see when we're doing that, it's helping them not just increase not just decrease customer service asks, mm -hmm. but actually increase repeat purchase and increase client retention because you know, the, the, today's consumer, we all have phones in our pocket. We're used to getting all of the information, all the data all the time. We want data, we want transparency even on a consumer level, and that's helping to breed trust and breed that repeat purchase that ultimately yields a, a better relationship. 100%. I mean, in the pandemic, 60% of consumers reported that they did business with a merchant they'd never done business with before. Mm -hmm. So think about all those first bites of the apple, right? That marketers desperately try to get, right? When they talk about, you know, new customer acquisition costs. But the key is you've been given this gift, yeah. right? Due to either inventory availability or lack of availability to get a bite of the apple. But if you don't, if you don't close that loop with transparency, speed, certainty, a seamless returns experience, that's one and done. And to your point, delivery certainty it's critical in that because if you tell me I'm going to get it on Thursday, then I'm not going to look for it on Wednesday. And oh, by the way, if something happens and I'm not going to get it on Thursday, if you tell me that on Wednesday, it's probably going to take some of the conflict out of it. Mm -hmm. And maybe you give me a coupon for the next purchase and I don't call your call center and you maybe even get another bite of the apple because you turned a negative into a positive and and that's using data to close that loop and connecting commerce and logistics into one experience. Uh, that's, that's exactly right. We, we've seen, um, we, we've seen a, a couple of different areas where we're, we're working with some of our customers to try to tie that, that delivery data and the tracking and, uh, and there's some AI that we use to anticipate if something's going to miss or we call it predicted to miss. And, mm. and the more that you can tie that back in and tie it all the way back to that end shopper experience, ultimately what you're trying to do is we all know it's crazy expensive in this world to acquire a customer to buy something the first time. Yeah. You know, our, our marketing budgets are challenged, marketing costs keep going up or, or the cost per transaction, it's harder to find those incremental customers. And so our, our motivation should be to surprise them, to delight them, and to make sure that they have 
even if it's going to be bad news, we can still deliver it in a great proactive way that really builds their, their loyalty and makes them want to come back because they know they can, they can trust you as the, as the merchant. Yeah. So sometimes they say CEOs get paid to see the future or see around mm -hmm. the corner, right? But I, I tell people if I could predict the future, honestly, I'd just go to the racetrack today, bet 3,000 races, and win them all. Yeah. Right, and then go talk to Elon about partnering at Twitter. That's right. <laughs> um, so, uh, but, so, I'm not asking you to predict the future, um, but as, as you're talking to your clients, leaning into 23, obviously the first quarter, right around the corner, um, you see a lot of economic headwinds out there, layoffs, reductions, down forecasts. What, what are you seeing as, what are your clients talking to you about? What are you, what are you seeing as maybe some of the big themes going into 23. Yeah, I, I think the I think the most common theme that's coming from from our customers is they're starting from the position of they don't quite know what's going to happen. And so they say, well, how do you prepare for not knowing what's going to happen? And you think about how can I react more quickly? How can I be more nimble, more agile? Uh, and how can I have more control? And, and how do I how do I go faster? And so, uh, you know, as we've been talking with them, a lot of our a lot of the investments we've made both for our brand and manufacturer side as well as for our, our retailer side has really been about giving our customers more tools, more flexibility, and more agility into their business. And so we see, uh, you know, there's one customer I was speaking with a few weeks ago that was looking at possibly switching up their, their whole model for how they work with some of their, some of their best suppliers, hmm. where they wanted, to, they wanted to change the dynamics of how much inventory sits in the, in the retailer's warehouse versus how much does the, the brand hold on to. And how, you know, sometimes you have lead times of six, nine, 12 months on some of these orders but how they were looking at saying, how do we make a change for Q1 of this year? And so we just see that, that continual look back on, on agility and speed and being able to react quickly. And, uh, and that's where we've been investing in, in our products sure. and services, and that's where we've been partnering with our customers. So we're coming to an end here on Commerce Conversations. Brian, I want to thank you for, for making the trip. I know, oh, thanks for having me. Like, I know you've got a ton going on. Great acquisition, congrats again. Thank you. Um, powerful combination of companies there. Um, so, just kind of wrap things up here. I'm just curious if, if I'm listening to this mm. or watching this and I want to go read something this weekend that will help me get better grounded in commerce or think about it in a different way, is there anything you'd recommend? So, so one of the things I find is, is really helpful as we go into the season of some uncertainty, you know, maybe, maybe some, some different macro factors at play, the, the, most, the best way to succeed is to really understand your customers and, and be focused on serving them. Whomever, all of us have customers in this world, how do we do that? And there's some folks who were, who were pretty early at Amazon for a while and they wrote this book called Working Backwards. Working Backwards? Working Backwards. Okay. And it is, uh, it's less about Amazon's direct e-commerce business and more about how Amazon operates internally. And everything comes down to this, to this fundamental concept of understanding what the customer really needs and then working backwards from there of how do you build it and how do you meet that need. And I think it, sometimes it sounds so simple, but it's, it's incredibly powerful and I found it in our organization, it really transforms the way that we, that we understand what the customer needs, that we can build for them, that we can find the best ways to serve them. And I find it has a, it has a really broad range of applicability. So it's, if somebody's looking for, for the Christmas read, I find that yeah. one's pretty powerful. Working backwards. Working backwards. Awesome. Well. That wraps this session up, this uh, conversation up that uh, we've been able to have here with Brian Dove, CEO of Commerce Hub. Uh, we hope you enjoyed our commerce conversation and we look forward to seeing you down the road and, and, and talking to more guests and educating and sharing in the world of commerce. Take care, everyone.